Good morning, D23. How we doing? <laughs> Welcome to uh, Secrets of the Lost Chords. We're, uh, we're an intimate group this morning. It's 10 a.m. It's early for a Sunday, but we're thrilled that you're all here. You're in for a real treat today. Uh, my name is Rob Sorrell. I have the privilege of leading the marketing organization for Walt Disney Records. Uh, I've worked for the company in various capacities for about 15 years, and the gentleman speaking to you today is, uh, is a gem in our organization. I have the privilege of working with him on product development, and he has worked for Walt Disney Records for 27 years this coming January, and there is nobody... Yeah. There is nobody more passionate or that loves our catalog and the history and the legacy behind it than this guy. He's a Grammy award-winning producer, and even when we have staff meetings every week, when Randy talks, we all listen intently and we love it because he loves us so much. So please uh, help me welcome Randy Thornton. Thank you. Great to be back at uh, D23. I hope you've been having a really great weekend. Um, by a show of hands, uh, how many of you recognize the songs that were being played by the string quartet as they came in? Kind of a silly question to ask people at the D23 Expo, <clears throat> particularly those in the audience on a presentation on Disney music. But uh, I'd venture to say that if you were to go anywhere on the planet and pull some random person aside, hum a few bars of any of these songs, not only would they identify it, they'd probably sing it for you, too. What? That's the wrong button. <laughs> there we go. I, I work in a technical field. Stop it! I, I did the Haunted Mansion last year. The equipment, anyway. <clears throat> Music has always played a vital part of everything that we do, from film, television, theater, theme parks. Uh, it's our language, in my mind. And not only are these great songs, these are songs that were written to serve a purpose. Either whether it be exposition, character or plot development, uh, atmosphere, they're there to help tell the story. As such, um, the songwriters are often involved in the story process itself, some to varying degrees, some more involved than others. And as a case in point, uh, Mr. Larry Morey sitting up there with his feet up on the desk, that's Frank Churchill up on the piano. Uh, Larry Morey was a story man who kind of got drafted into writing lyrics. And he and Frank Churchill wrote a number of songs, and I think they did pretty well because they wrote all the songs for Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Uh, and a few others, Frank Churchill wrote the music for Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf? And over in that far corner is Al Hoffman, Matt David, and Jerry Livingston. Uh, these are Tin Pan Alley songwriters, weren't really Disney staff songwriters. In fact, they really weren't uh, Disney staff songwriters in the 60s when the Shermans came on board, the first and only staff songwriters. Um, but Walt wanted something really punchy and really needed to have successful music for Cinderella, and I'll, I'll get a little bit more into that later. And down at the lower corner here, we have Frank Churchill again. Walt Disney, and a gentleman by the name of Lee Harling, who put words to, uh, who put music to Ned Washington's words that gave us When You Wish Upon a Star. And uh, Bob and Dick Sherman, who wrote just about everything else. <laughs> now as the story evolves, so do the songs. Sometimes the lyrics are changed, sometimes the lyrics are scrapped outright altogether. Sometimes entire sequences are removed, including the song or songs that went with them. And sometimes, uh, in the early development, the song just may not have the right message that Walt wants to say about the character. And these songs are unused. And those are the songs that we have come to call the Lost Chords. Now, I first became aware of these kinds of songs uh, in the late 80s. Uh, I was the department clerk for Walt Disney Records when I first started, and I discovered the Sherman Brothers' original pre-demo tape of the songs they wrote for Mary Poppins. And in it, uh, some of the lyrics were a little bit different. There were songs I'd never heard of before, 
and uh, kind of sort of put that off to the side, and it was that tape that actually helped me start the whole soundtrack restoration process. And shortly after that, uh, through luck and happenstance, I became the custodian of the studio's acetate library. Now, acetates were the precursor to audio tape. Um, what they would do is these big 14-inch discs uh, that were lacquered. Some of them were based on glass and some of them were based on aluminum. And they would actually scribe and lay the record uh, to make recordings for other people uh, to listen to. And in this library there are voice artist auditions, uh, dialogue recording sessions, and original song demos. And demos of the classics that we all know, and demos of these lost chords. And in the early 90s, when I started the soundtrack uh, restoration process, I included a couple of these demos uh, on the, several of the soundtracks. But the bulk of them came to light when I helped home video uh, find a lot of these songs for the deluxe laser discs. So that's how far back we go. <laughs> um, and so some of these have been out before, and as I said, I put some on the soundtracks. But a gentleman by the name of Russell Schroeder took things a step further. <laughs> now, Russell was a 29-year veteran of the studio, and hearing these demos and songs, he went into the studio's music library, and it, it's quite amazing that we have all of the manuscripts for all the scores of all the movies we have ever done. Not just the original orchestrated lead sheets, but the oboe part, the first violin part, the viola part, everything. And in and amongst these boxes are also the sketches of songs that never made it into the films. So Russell would go and do the research, dig out those songs, found more than what I had been able to find so far uh, in the acetates, went to the animation research library, uh, dug out concept art of those corresponding songs, what he did, and published, self-published, two beautiful books uh, that includes the piano vocal music, little stories about where that song came from, and some of that concept art. Well, what I'm doing now is taking that even a step further. We are going into the studio and recording these, fully orchestrated, with a real acoustic orchestra, no MIDI. And um, now, as I said, we're orchestrating these and trying to emulate the style in which the film that they were intended, but I'm not recording these with character voices. Uh, though some of the songs are still in character for the characters that we know today, but a lot of them aren't. And I'd rather things be consistent as far as this whole product line is concerned. So I'm casting vocals that have that same kind of texture, that have that same kind of feel uh, of what the voices would be. Um, and I'm going to get into a little bit of how a song can become a lost chord. Um, for those of you who know of Disney's Alice in Wonderland, you know that Alice's opening song, uh, she is confiding into her cat Diana on how much better it would be uh, to live in a world of her own. Now that song was written by Bob Hilliard and Sammy Fain. But originally, they had written another song for that very same sequence called Beyond the Laughing Sky. Now, Beyond the Laughing Sky talks of a magical place that already exists. You know, uh, beyond the laughing sky, somewhere over the rainbow. Which could be part of the reason why it wasn't used, but I think more importantly it wasn't used because, as I said, she's talking about a world that already exists. Whereas the song that was in the film, that was finally selected, it's a world of her own. It's a, it's a world that Alice herself had imagined and created, which is better for that character and a better storytelling. Um, but a good melody uh, is rarely lost, uh, particularly when there's another film right on the heels of Alice in Wonderland. And with new lyrics by Sammy Kong, Beyond the Laughing Sky became... You win. See, when you have a real deal like that with the Disney audience, they go, well, I know. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> um, this next one is uh, from the Aristocats, and it was from a sequence that was actually cut, and if you picked up the recent edition from home video of uh, the DVD of Alice in One of uh, the Aristocats, both start with an A. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, thank you very much. Believe me, you have no idea. Um, uh, the Aristocats, this was from a cut sequence, and if you picked up the recent DVD, there's a terrific bonus feature where Richard Sherman explains where the song came from and why it ended up not being used. And the way it was is Edgar the butler, even in the earliest stages, was evil and manipulative. Um, and, but there was a maid named Elvira who was innocent. And when Edgar overheard that uh, Madame Bonfumi was going to be giving some of her estate to Edgar and some to Elvira, uh, Edgar decided to woo Elvira in order to take her hand and her money. Um, which then Elvira, an innocent, is thinking of being wooed and taken care of and doted upon, and she sings a song called Court Me Slowly. And obviously Edgar's has this double meaning in how much you mean to me monetarily. And the way it worked was Edward, Edgar would be singing his song, and then Elvira would be singing her song, and then the two would be singing in counterpoint together. Now, the demos are just as important as our new recordings, but I'm only going to be playing clips of those today because I have limited time. But uh, this one I'm playing in full because one, it tells a story. You'll hear Edgar's song, Elvira's song, and then the counterpoint. And you'll hear Bob, and you, play, you hear Dick Sherman singing both Elvira and Edgar. And the counterpoint is one of those rare occurrences where we're actually going to hear Bob Sherman sing. So here's their original demo. It's a, it's a terrific little song. And uh, when we re-recorded it, uh, we had Richard Sherman in the studio. I've known Richard for you know 26 years now and uh, uh, wanted to make sure that we were going to be getting things exactly the way he wanted them. So here is our new recording. <laughs> and all you Disney hardcore fans out there, here's a test. Who was the male vocalist in that one? All right. <laughs> Good thing I didn't have a car. Oh, well, then, of course you know. Um, I, I can't even begin to tell you what an incredible thrill it is to sit there and work with Richard Sherman. Um, both he and Bob and, well, all the Disney composers, for that matter, have given us so much and, you know, influenced my entire career uh, to be in a position now to help bring songs to life that he thought were gone um, is an incredible thrill and an incredible honor and a way to give something back in, in my mind. Um, the Sherman Brothers had also written another song for Aristocats that was vying for the same sequence. And this song was called The Jazz Hot. Here's their original clip of their demo. And now our new recording. The other song that was vying for that same sequence, and actually one, was Everybody Wants to Be a Cat, which is a classic in itself, but that's a great, this is a great song too. So, you know, I wouldn't have wanted to make that decision. Next we go on to uh, The Rescuers. Uh, this was something really quite interesting. Floyd Huddleston, who has written several things and actually incidentally was the co-author of uh, Everybody Wants to Be a Cat, see that nice transition there? <laughs> I did that on purpose. Um, he had written three songs for a bear character that was going to be in The Rescuers. Now, at one point, the bear was an escaped circus bear, and the other one was a polar bear who hated the cold and dreamed of living in the tropics. <laughs> and as you can see from this picture, he is enjoying the backside of water. <laughs> um, Louis was so enthralled about coming in and being in another animated feature after uh, The Jungle Book, he actually came to the studio to discuss it some more. But here is Floyd Huddleston's, a clip of Floyd Huddleston's original demo for doing what I really do best. Now, Louis, as I said, Louis was so enthralled about being part of another Disney animated feature that not only did he come out to the studio to talk about it some more, um, he actually recorded the songs which is why we decided not to re-record these, because you don't re-record Louis Prima. 
So here is Louis Prima doing what I really do best. What was an added benefit uh, with these songs, uh, Floyd Hilson songs for me, was uh, I found Louis's recordings and then I found Floyd Hilson's original piano demos. And I'd known Houston Huddleston, uh, Floyd's son, for quite some time, and he never knew that his dad had recorded those. So I was able to give those back to him as part of the family. Um, when Cinderella uh, began production, uh, Mac David, Jerry Livingston, and Al Hoffman, the guys who wrote all the songs uh, for Cinderella, they actually, as I said, they were Tin Pan Alley songwriters, and uh, they got Walt's attention for a song they wrote for Perry Como called Chibaba, which is sort of a nonsense word, which obviously Walt seemed to become fond of. Um, and it was sort of an Italian lullaby. Uh, and he thought that that would be a great kind of sense that they would want to do for the magic song for, uh, for Cinderella. So one of the songs they had written that ended up becoming a lost chord is a song called I'm in the Middle of a Muddle. Now I had released this as part of the Cinderella soundtrack back in the late 90s, so you might already be familiar with it. So here's just a clip of the original demo. And here's our new recording. Now, uh, we've come to find that that song really wasn't used because Walt didn't want to have Cinderella give the appearance that she's complaining. And if you notice in the film, she never really does. She's a little bit upset about the clock in the morning, about waking her from her dream, but she just goes about her things figuring that, you know, at some point things will take care of themselves and she'll have the fairy tale ending that she always dreamed of. But um, Cinderella was a very crucial film for the studio. Um, there was a thing in 1941 that we got involved in, you know, a little skirmish over in Europe. Um, I sort of closed the whole box office thing. I think it was called World War II. Yeah. yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, when Pinocchio was released, everything had just sort of broken out in Europe, and Walt had lost that half the world uh, in revenue, and you know, Pinocchio was almost considered uh, a financial failure because of that. Um, the studio became actually occupied territory during the war. Uh, the army showed up one day, and uh, Walt was uh, commissioned to do training films, propaganda films. The artists were designing insignias and nose art and everything. And when the war finally ended, even though Walt was able to stay afloat all these years, he needed to make sure that the next animated film was going to be a success, which is one of the reasons why he decided to go back to the fairy tale again. Um, after doing things like Fantasia and really expanding what animation could do, he needed to really hedge his bets and make sure everything was safe. So that's one of the reasons why he called in uh, Tin Pan Alley songwriters, well-known songwriters, just to sort of hedge his bets. Um, but uh, Larry Morey and Charles Wolcott had been writing some other songs uh, for Cinderella while this was going on. And here is a song called Sing a Little, Dream a Little, their original demo. Actually, that's the next slide. Now, you notice that that was a little choppy um, at the beginning, well, uh, throughout the whole thing, actually. Um, that was an acetate, and so was the next the demo I'll be playing later on, uh, that was actually on glass, and it was broken. Um, usually they were, particularly the glass, the glass um, acetates were only scribed on one side, so what we ended up doing was placing everything down, face down, taping it together, flipping it over, and trying to get a read off the turntable from it, and trying to edit out um, the gaps and things. But sometimes, you know, little shards were missing, so you'd hear things slip and, and stuff like that. Um, just wanted to explain that some of these are in really, really rough condition. So it's even more important to preserve these and record these. And here's our new recording of Sing a Little, Dream a Little. See, these are just as Disney as the songs we're all familiar with. There's that feeling, there's that heart, there's that thing, that, that intangible that you can't put your finger on. Um, Larry Morey and Charles Walcott also wrote another song uh, for Cinderella called The Dress My Mother Wore. Now, if you remember in the film, she does refer to the dress that she intends to wear to the ball as being her mother's dress. 
Well, in this version of Cinderella, uh, Larry Morey and Charles Wolcott wrote this song that gives an entire backstory to the dress that my mother wore. And here is a clip of the original demo and our new recording. Isn't that an absolutely beautiful song? Can you imagine if that had actually been in the film when just a few scenes later, the evil stepsisters rip it to shreds? <laughs> rip your heart out, throw it on the ground, and stomp on it. Could be one of the reasons why the song wasn't used, really, you know? Because it would fo shift focus from Cinderella and her plight to a dress and that meaning, and would probably make the evil stepsisters probably just a little too evil. So now we go off to Neverland. Now, Walt got the rights uh, to do an animated film on Mary Poppins in the late 1930s, but again, you know, that silly conflict in, the, in, in Europe that we got involved in and everybody else got involved in kind of belayed things for a while. But Larry, uh, Frank Churchill had already started writing and developing themes for it, and uh, with Larry Morey, wrote this song called When the Bosun Pipes a Tune. Now, I actually included uh, this demo on the Peter Pan soundtrack in the late 90s, um, but all the documentation that we found at the time, it was called the Bosun Song. And then Russell did more research and found that they were actually two names. So when the Bosun pipes a tune, also known as the Bosun Song. Um, so here's the, a clip of the original demo. Now, we don't know at that point of this version of the story who was actually gonna be singing it. Um, I, I think it was before uh, Smee was going, as a character, and definitely before Hook was going to be Hans Conrad. So, in keeping with the style of the song, I cast a vocal to kind of mimic what the original demo artists did, sort of that music hall kind of style. So, here's our recording of When the Bosun Pipes a Tune. That was a real penny whistle being played there, and he's pitch bending and doing all those trills like that. He won't talk to me anymore. Uh, again, this next song uh, is a pirate song that was intended, well, actually, the, the demo kind of sets up what the story was, and it, this was, again, before Hans Conried was cast as uh, Captain Hook, which brings a whole new level of the character. So here's the demo of the pirate song. He says like he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> And our new recording, obviously not knowing what the pirates were to have sounded like in that version, I just sort of cast Disney-esque kind of pirates. So here's our version of the pirate song. <laughs> obviously that little bit there is for Mr. Ravenscroft. Um, the Lost Chords are available digitally uh, on iTunes, Amazon MP3, and for the Cinderella songs, I actually included them on the Collector's Edition soundtrack that we just put out last year, so you can actually get it as physical product. Um, I have plans for many, many others coming up, and uh, as a matter of fact, just this last Monday, we began production and preliminary talks about the next group of Lost Chords. Richard Sherman will be coming into the studio. We were in there uh, just last Monday. Um, Walt Disney Records is back now on the studio lot in the old team building, the birthplace of Imagineering. And our artist lounge is called the Sherman Room. And so we were in there with Bob talking about how we're going to do all these arrangements. And uh, when I got the idea to do the Lost Chords and re-record them, um, I was given a small budget uh, to give an example of what these songs would be. And one of them, uh, La Jazz Hot, is one of those songs that I'd done that it was pretty much finished uh, when we finished recording it. Of course, that makes sense. Um, but we recorded the North Pole Polka, um, and it's intended for an entire bear, you know, walruses and seals and bears and everything, but we didn't have the money to get all those vocalists in, and Juliana Hansen, who sang several of the Cinderella songs, uh, was in the studio, and Ty Taylor, who sang the jazz hot, so 
they're singing the leads and everybody else in the studio is singing chorus, uh, myself included. <laughs> Thank God for auto-tune. And um, Richard Sherman also has a vocal in here, which most of it is going to stay. I'm going to skip the demo and I'm going to play our, our new, well, our temporary version. You people are the first to hear it. Nobody else is going to hear it after this. So here is our version of the North Pole Polka. The North Pole Polka is sunk. That's the one. So hopefully we'll have Harry Poppins Lost Sports out in time for uh, the 250th anniversary. I'm going to rush through a little bit of things here. We're, we're, we're kind of finished with the Lost Sports. Thought you might like to know that next Tuesday we'll see the release of the updated official albums for Disneyland and Disney World. There'll be 12, there are 12 new tracks on Disneyland and seven new on uh, Disney World. And as you people know, that these are souvenir albums for the people who don't go all the time and want to take that thing home. So Grim Grinny Go, Small World, and all that stuff's going to be all over again, be there all over again. Except this time, uh, for those of you who already have 12 versions of these things already, um, they're available digitally. So you'll be able to pick the tracks that you don't have to your collection already. Now, these places also have limitations uh, sometimes on length, but I don't think any of the new tracks are that uh, fall under that, so you should be able to get everything you wanted. And if you like the string quartet music that was done earlier as you were coming in, that's an album I produced last year called Classically Disney, also available digitally and at the parks. And that kind of wraps it up for the Lost Chords. Um, there is something that I want to say. Um, I've worked for the company for 27 years, and I feel it's important that I say something about our first recording artist. And that was the last Mouseketeer cast for the Mickey Mouse Club, and the only one cast by Walt Disney himself. Uh, Walt was badgered into going to see a dance recital to, to see a prospective Mouseketeer, but it was Annette that caught his eye. And so enamored with her, uh, he all but signed her on the spot. And when production began on the Mickey Mouse Club, uh, some of the folks there were thinking that maybe Darlene Gillespie might be the breakout star. She was vivacious and had a great voice and she could dance and everything. But when the Mickey Mouse Club debuted in October of 1955, it wasn't long before America made their decision. And it was Annette Funicello that was everyone's favorite mouseketeer. Um, when she, she was so popular, in fact, that the studio ended up having to hide most of her fan mail from the other Mouseketeers so nobody would get jealous. But when she sang a song uh, called How Will I Know My Love in an episode of Spin and Marty, the studio was inundated with requests for a record of that song. And as it turns out, Disneyland Vista Records, now Walt Disney Records, had just started. I don't even know if we were in business for a year at that point. And they went to Tutti Camerata, a legend in his own right, created Sunset Sound Recorders, one of the most important recording studios during the 60s and 70s. Google them, you'll be impressed. And said, um, we would like to do this. And he goes, you know, I think Annette really could have a singing career, uh, but we need to find the right song. He goes, well, we'll just do, you know, How Will I Know My Love? Well, then we won't know whether it's a song or her. So we need to find the right song. So one of our East Coast operatives in the Disney Music Group, um, a gentleman by the name of Mo Prescal, heard a song on the radio. And he drove to the radio station, found that song, sent it off to Tootie and says, I think this is the song. That song is called Tall Paul and was written by Bob and Dick Sherman. And the Sherman brothers got their start at Walt Disney Records. The badge of honor right there. Um, to this day, Bob and Dick have always referred to Annette as their lucky star. Uh, when the Mickey Mouse Club ended, uh, Annette was the only one to remain under contract. And she went to Walt because uh, she knew that he had plans for her career and says, you know, I think I should change my last name. And he goes, why? Aren't you proud of your Italian heritage? He goes, well, of course I am, but nobody can pronounce Funicello. He goes, once they do, they'll never forget it. Your name stays. <laughs> yes, Mr. Disney. <laughs> now, the studio, as you know, has always been first name basis. Uh, the Mouseketeers called him Uncle Walt, except for Annette. She couldn't bring herself to call him uh, Uncle Walt or Walt. She always called him Mr. Disney. 
Um, when she got the opportunity to do the Beach movies, she went to Walt and says, do you think this is something I should do? And she goes, yes, I think it'd be great for your career, but I want you to keep in mind that uh, you have an image to maintain. And if you could wear a one piece, that'd be great. Um, she told me uh, that it wasn't until years later that she realized that Walt was actually joking about the one piece. In 1993, I produced the Annette box set, uh, Annette, a musical reunion with America's Girl Next Door. And I had Tootie, oh, thank you. I had Tootie Camarada in the studio, Bruce Botnick, her original engineer, who was also the engineer for the doors at the same time. Annette Funicello, the doors. <laughs> Uh, and Bob and Dick Sherman. Uh, but before we started production, I called Annette and told her that we were doing this set, and she was just so tickled she couldn't believe it. You know, those silly little recordings? And I go, yes, absolutely, I want to talk to you and see what it is that you would like to see on the set as well. So she invited us to her house, and I think it was only about a year since she had come out with uh, having MS, and she was walking with the cane. And she greeted us at the door, and after we exchanged pleasantries, she couldn't help but tell us about her new gift. Evidently, some Disney fans, some of you might even be in the audience today, saw her walking with a typical uh, aluminum cane, and that wasn't good enough for Annette. So they had a fundraiser, and they had a cane designed and made for her. It was clear acrylic with Disney characters spun throughout it, and it was like her prized possession. And she just kept talking about us, and she led us into, the, into her living room, where it was nicely appointed, little Disney memorabilia there. She curled up in uh, an overstuffed chair with one knee and began to tell us stories and, and uh, relate her career to us. And I felt like it was in a net slumber party. <laughs> and then I realized that everything that everybody had ever told me, the Sherman brothers, uh, Tootie Camarada, Frankie Avalon, Paul Anka, Shelley Fabre, Tommy Sands, everything they said about her was actually true. The person you saw on the screen was Annette Funicello. That was no act. She was true and she was genuine. I just want to say thanks to our first artist. The Sherman Brothers Lucky Star and everybody's favorite musketeer. Annette.